Welcome to Brains and Machines, a deep dive into neuromorphic engineering and biologically inspired technology. In this episode, Professor Emre Neftsi, director of the Neuromorphic Software Ecosystems Group at the Peter Grunberg Institute, talks about architectures and algorithms for use with neuromorphic technology. Your hosts are Dr. Sonny Baines of University College London and Dr. Julia D'Angelo of Fortis in Munich. Welcome to Brains and Machines. I am Julia D'Angelo. And I'm Sunny Baines. In today's episode, Sunny is talking about learning with Professor Emre Nefci of the Peter Grunberg Institute, PGI. After the interview, we will be talking to Ralph Etienne Cummings from Johns Hopkins University about the issues raised. Thank you, Julia. Emre leads the Neuromorphic Software Ecosystems Group at the PGI, where he and his colleagues are thinking not so much about the underlying physical substrate, but how neurons can be trained and organized to learn in an efficient and brain-inspired way. You'll hear about his work in making backpropagation compatible with spiking neural networks, dealing with device variability, and one or few shot learning. There are links to his work and some of the specific papers we'll be discussing on our website. You can check them out at brainsandmachines.net. I met Emre at his office in Aachen. Emre Nefci, welcome to Brains and Machines. First, can you tell me a little bit about your technical background? Sure. So I'm a physicist. I've been studying at the EPFL Lausanne. I've studied mostly condensed matter physics. And at the end of my studies, I was interested in moving in a domain that was more lively and future looking. And so this is how I moved into neuromorphic engineering. Neuromorphic engineering really combines the ideas of physics with natural computing and neuroscience. So what got you interested in that area? How did you come across it? Well, the story was that I had to take classes outside my area when I was in Lausanne and took the class of Wolfram Gerstner, who was a very prominent researcher in the area of neuroscience and particularly in computational neuroscience and learning. And I really liked his class. And after I was done with my master's, I went to him and said, I want to continue doing this. Can you suggest any people, in particular Zurich? I wanted to go to Zurich at that time. And this is how I got in contact with Giacomo in the very at the Institute of Neuroinformatics. And he showed me how he is building neuroscience into silicon, basically the technology that we use to build our processors today. But the way that these circuits are built really uses the physics of the devices. And I found that is a place where I could contribute because my area was, as I mentioned, in condensed matter physics, as well as nonlinear dynamics. So really combined all the ingredients I really loved already and looking to the future of computing. You're best known for your work in surrogate gradient networks. Can you explain why they're important in this field? We took a long path to arrive to surrogate gradient. So perhaps I'll take one step back and explain how we got there. So as I was doing my PhD in Zurich with Giacomo Indeveri and Rodney Douglas, Giacomo had these amazing chips that had circuits of neurons built into them that we could connect in arbitrary ways and program them through a computer in many different ways. And so the question then became, how can we program these chips in order to achieve some interesting computation? And this is actually not so different from how we use our computers, right? We have a programming language, we compile that programming language into a set of instructions that are processor can understand. And so we asked the question, what would be the equivalent for these neuromorphic chips? And at the beginning, we thought of how to implement the classical building blocks of computers, which are finite state machines. And that was essentially my thesis. But once we were done with this, we were asked with the question. So we programmed these chips from the top down. Essentially, a programmer comes in and says, this is what I wanted to do. But this is not necessarily how our brain works. At least for most of the uh, part, it is self-programmed by learning. Uh, as I, I finished my thesis, I started thinking, how can we actually teach these chips to learn to perform this behavior? And this was at the beginning of the neural networks hype in 2012. So there we started exploring some ideas of machine learning 
and namely the workhorse of training deep networks today, which is uh, gradient back propagation. In terms of biological processes, and in particular, those that are implemented in these neuromorphic chips. These are spiking chips, right? Spiking That's with spiking communication. So without getting too deep into the maths, can you tell us how these surrogate gradient networks work? So the surrogate gradients worked by building an analogy between artificial neural networks and spiking neural networks. We realized at the time that the spiking neural network is very similar to a subset of deep neural networks called recurrent neural networks in that they describe a process in time. There was one part that was a problem in applying gradient descent to these types of spiking neural networks, which is the fact that the neurons spike. And if you think of what gradient descent is doing is actually to determine a slope Right, we determine the slope of how the loss changes with respect to a parameter. But if that involves all or none or these jumps, then we can't calculate that slope really well. So the surrogate gradients, in terms of programming, it's a one-liner trick to avoid this by assuming that that spike is actually a smooth bump on which we can actually calculate the gradients. But we only do this when we train the network, when we actually apply it as in just run the data through our algorithm, we eventually use the spikes. This is why it's called the surrogate gradients, because we're actually defining a surrogate model on which we calculate the gradients, and then we use the results of those gradients to train our network. Now, my understanding from machine learning and from neuromorphic is that the way these things are usually approached is that you do the training of a network in some kind of really inefficient way on a big machine. And then often the inference, the using of that knowledge is done on something much smaller and more efficient, or at least that's the hope with neuromorphic engineering. So your technique really lends itself to that in that you're having to put in more effort to calculate presumably these surrogate gradients. But then once you run them, they're running as nice, efficient spiking neural networks. Would that be a fair characterization? That is a fair characterization. I will add to that a little bit. It is correct that we basically define a method that allows to use conventional machine learning tools to train these neural networks. And we can then map the result of that training onto hardware. But the most beautiful part of it, and this is what really appealed to me as a scientist, was that the learning rules that we derive through this exercise of gradient descent with these spiking neural networks creates the learning rules that we need to implement on the chip should we want to do this online on the chip, as you described. And these learning rules that occur at the synapse, that's the process that's called synaptic plasticity. We now had a way to construct synaptic plasticity rules from first principles, in this case, a simple principle of gradient descent. So it both provides a mechanism for training the networks offline, but also a mechanism for learning online, and even can help neuroscientists understand the data that they're seeing. Now, more recently, you've been extending this work in various ways. Can you talk a little bit about how? I'm a very hands-on person. So what happened once we implemented these surrogate gradient methods and the related methods is that they didn't work so well in practice, right? So if we built a uh, chip or even a simulation that used these learning rules based on the surrogate gradients, it did learn very slowly, right? So we needed to present a lot of samples. Now, without going too much into the details, we can hook this up with a special camera that can take some visual inputs and transform them into events and spikes that the chip can understand. So we need to repeat many of these samples to the chip for it to learn. And worst of this was that after you've taught it a couple of classes of samples or it learned something, it tended to forget the first ones, 
right? So this is a phenomenon known as catastrophic forgetting, which is actually one of the main challenges of applying machine learning to continually learning systems. We need to protect that old data. The brain is actually using several memory systems and consolidation mechanisms to prevent this. So then we're thinking, well, how can we actually use these learning rules, which work so well if we train them offline? How can we use them online in a similar way that humans learn? We don't learn by first shutting off our brain and then training it and then applying it. We learn as we behave. This is where we've found ways of extending surrogate gradients along a so-called learning to learn. As we were discussing earlier, we were talking about the training mechanism offline and the learning mechanism online. Can we use these two together? And the answer is yes. Now, all of this is happening in the simulation. We train the neural network to learn efficiently. And once we apply the results of this offline training onto the chip, we have a system that can learn using only a few iterations. Now, this solved the problem of slow training and to some extent even solves the problem of catastrophic forgetting because we don't need to make that many updates. If we don't update that much, we don't disturb what was already there. So I understand that this kind of approach can be used to help solve the problem of variability in some of these new devices that we're thinking of using in neuromorphic engineering, things like memristors, analog devices, phase change devices, where they don't all work in exactly the same way, so you get slightly different behavior. Is that true? Can you use it for that? So the really interesting aspect of this learning to learn is exactly what you mentioned. Because we can optimize for any learning dynamic, this can be, for example, the synaptic plasticity dynamics, we can introduce any behavior or misbehavior of these emerging devices that you've mentioned, such as resistive RAMs and phase change memories. Now, we're really early in these studies, but we have shown in simulations of these devices that if we learn to learn with the memristor dynamics and all its variability, so-called cycle-to-cycle -cycle or device-to-device -device variability, we find that the gap between the ideal device and these memristor is largely closed. And this works really well with the idea of using these emerging devices for online learning. Because anyway, we are never going to use these devices, or in most cases, we are not going to use these devices for training from scratch. We're going to pre-chain the network, apply it onto the memory stores, say, in the lab or at a factory. And then this is going to be fine-tuned for the particular user in this particular environment. And in that sense, if we can get rid of some of the problems that the emerging devices may show, or maybe the limited endurance, for example, we can't program them very often, then we can overcome a lot of the issues here. It's very interesting because it changes all the metrics that people thought were important for these memristors, especially in this neuromorphic application. In fact, we find that we don't need to think so much about things like endurance or precision because we can build all of this in the training part. Now, there always will be a little bit of an overhead, right? In terms of whenever you're having to train in the presence of noise, that means you're going to have to have a few more neurons, a little bit more resource in order to do that, right? So what we're really describing is two phases of the whole training process. One, as I mentioned, is really offline, and the other one is online. You're right that this whole story has a potentially expensive offline phase. We have to realize that if we're building 1 million of these chips, we only need to do that offline phase once. So that cost is amortized across all those 1 million devices. That's where the cost of the variability is going to occur. Once we've actually taken care of that by learning to learn, that cost isn't really present at the online part. Perhaps we need to do a couple of more iterations, but it'll be fairly small. Most importantly, the benefit of using the emerging devices, which have this variability, would largely overcome that increase of time that we need to learn. So I've noticed 
recently that with the explosion of machine learning, deep learning, transformer models, that the neuromorphic community has started to get interested in working more on what we would call perhaps conventional machine learning techniques. Can you talk a little bit about that and why you think it's important? Well, sure. I mean, actually, the surrogate gradients, I'd like to believe it was part of the cause of the explosion of the interests of using machine learning into neuromorphic engineering. But it is clear that machine learning, especially artificial neural networks, tells us how we should organize or how it should self-organize the network in order to achieve a certain task. And before neural networks, we didn't really know how to do this. So it's clear that machine learning and artificial neural networks have a clear role to play in our understanding and design of neuromorphic hardware as a technology. But there's also danger too, right? In the sense that a lot of people are concerned that what we might call conventional approaches to neural networks and machine learning might just run over neuromorphic because the relentless march of digital com computing, von Neumann computing, seems to push away everything in its path. So do you think neuromorphic can still find a place? Well, I think it does have a place. We don't often talk about the costs of running these machine learning algorithms. If you fire up your chat GPT, every conversation is basically going to cost you a couple of cents per iteration. So this is a place where neuromorphic engineering can come in by reducing the costs of running machine learning algorithms. And where does this become useful? Well, I don't think it's going to become useful for chat GPT because those algorithms are running as large and as fast as they can. So if you build something that's lower power, they'll just build bigger ones, which makes sense. The places where neuromorphic engineering can become more relevant is really where power is important, such as in your handheld devices, your earbuds, cars, even to some extent. We can imagine having something like ChatGPT running online in a car can actually be very useful to the driver. This is the kind of application I think that neuromorphic engineering clearly has a role to play. In addition to this, anything that relates to low latency, such as in the control algorithms, the control over robots, latency is extremely important. In fact, often the control signal must be below about 20 milliseconds in many cases. If you want to do intelligent computations within that 20 milliseconds, you need to have a pretty damn good computer. Neuromorphic hardware, in analogy to the brain, has the capability of delivering on those latencies. So I think that is yet another area where neuromorphic engineering can help. So to summarize, we have basically energy and latency. So what other kinds of applications are you looking at for neuromorphic? So we're really looking at applications that emphasize this idea of these metrics of energy and latency. So these are, I mentioned robotics earlier, so that's certainly one of them but also in signal processing in brain-machine interfaces. For example, we can have a prosthetic arm that is recording EMG. EMG stands for electromyography. These are sensors that record the contraction of a muscle. And from those uh, muscle contractions, we can determine what the user was intending to do. So for example, in a person that has lost his hands, some of those muscles are still there. We can still capture those signals. Now, if we have a device that can, for example, process those signals and actuate a robotic hand, then we have a prosthetic device for that uh, person that operates in a mostly natural way. And just to tie the story back to learning, these prosthetic devices are often removed at night and worn again. So every time you actually wear it, you need to recalibrate it. And the calibration is actually nothing else than learning. All those learning Dynamics, as I mentioned, this online learning actually plays an important role in controlling that prosthetic device. Now, I know that among some of the other things we've talked about, you're also interested in neuromorphic devices for smart cities. Can you talk a little bit about that? Right. So this is on a slightly other end of our applications. The ones I mentioned earlier really strives on energy and latency. The project that we have on smart cities, so what we're trying to do here 
is to reduce the cost of processing images on a traffic intersection, which now, at least in Germany and the cities where we have these traffic intersection setups, that data is sent to a, a processor a computer far away from the intersection. So what we're trying to do now is to build the processing of the vision at the sensors. Basically, these sensors would be mounted en masse on top of a traffic intersection in a German city. And by doing this, we can have a processing that's much lower power. And also by virtue of how these sensors work, they're much more robust to the weather conditions and night and day conditions. This is not a problem that's that limited by energy in the sense of having something run on your phone or on your robot. But it is much less compared to running these operations on a general purpose computer in a cloud server. You point out that it's not about energy efficiency in the smart cities traffic application. But actually, one of the things we have to be aware of is energy is really one of the things that neuromorphic can add. And as a physicist, this idea of computation with physics giving you the best possible computational bang for your buck, if you like. Does that make sense to you? And is that what interests you here? Absolutely. Actually, I'd like to take maybe one step back. Really, one of the core motivations I have to working with this field, which really keeps me up every day. This is that actually the brains have learned to optimize energy among everything else. A very uh, nice talk of a researcher, I can't recall his name, unfortunately, who was saying that actually a human would be able to walk half of the United States without food, assuming it has enough water, before collapsing. Not even a car could do this. Of course, that relates to the energy efficiency of the body, but it does also reflect itself to the brain. It's an incredibly energy efficient machine. So the way that it achieves this is really by using a different computational architecture and strategy. Okay, so this is, I think, a well understood and accepted fact. By exploiting the physics, of our systems, memoristic devices, emerging devices, or silicon, we can actually reap somewhat similar uh, benefits to the brain. This comes at a cost, of course, in that we don't know how to use physics for doing smart computations, such as, I guess today we could state ChatGPT as being the smartest thing that we can build today. We don't know how to build the ChatGPTs, just starting with physics. But we do have some ideas of how we can modify our neuromorphic architectures towards the building blocks of GPTs, which are these transformers. Emre Nefti, thanks for coming on to Brains and Machines. Thank you very much. It was very exciting to be here. Thanks, Sunny. I really liked Emre's point of view on lots of things. And for more about Emre's work, please go to brainsandmachines.net. Now, we welcome back our regular commentator, Professor Ralph Etienne Cummings from Johns Hopkins University. Sunny, Julia, how are you? Wonderful to see you again. Hi, Ralph. So what can I say? I very much enjoyed listening to Emre, and he talked about lots of applications and real-world applications. It was magic for me. Emre does something that is really out of my comfort zone, and uh, I understood one of the problems is the slow training and the catastrophic forgetting, and this can be solved with meta-learning or learning to learn. But I wonder if the problem of requiring lots of samples is still there. And uh, also the second question is that he talks about the fact that the brain uses several memory systems to consolidate what's learned. But there are any examples of this? Are we trying to emulate this? You know something about this, guys? Yeah, so I think people have been dealing with the notion of catastrophic forgetting for a long time, right? Especially in online systems. Systems that continuously learn. One person that I would point to is a guy named um, Joshua Vogelstein, who has spent some time on building models that has these three components. One that is for robustness, another component that is for um, longevity in the memories that it learns or the weights that it learns, and I forget what the third piece is. But then the, combined together, you are able then to construct a system that 
continuously just updates or tweaks on the margin just the weights that does not allow you to forget the previous things that you have, right? And this is in classical machine learning uh, uh, approaches, right? It's not neuromorphic in that sense. It's not anything that would be classically considered to be neuromorphic. It's just understanding how do we learn new things without forgetting everything else that we've learned. And then, of course, everything has a trajectory on forgetting, right? We cannot learn new things if we don't forget because all networks have capacities. After a certain point, once you've hit the capacity, then what's going to happen, right? You're not going to be able to learn anything else. So there has to be a time delay to the kind of losing your memory. But then that's okay. We do that too. I can't remember what I did when I was 10 years old anymore, right? It's part of our development. So it's that combination of the temporal dynamics of the weights and the ability to incrementally change the weights in such a way that does not undo the previous updates that you've done is what's really key about this means not to have catastrophic forgetting. You made me think of a colleague who used to be at Imperial College and then he was at Southampton and now he's here in Edinburgh, so not far from me. Themis Podromakis is doing some really interesting things related to having memristors as neurons that learn in different time scales. So they learn both in the long time scale for a classifier, but they also learn in the short time scale for short-term memory, things that are transient. And they learn essentially at different depths within the same device. So it's almost a memory on top of another memory. I seem to remember he called it a palimpsest memory. I don't know if it's strictly relevant to the sort of catastrophic forgetting issues that you've been talking about, but it was interesting work for me, so it might be interesting for some of the listeners. Agreed. And all of these approaches that allows us to coexist in terms of things that we don't want to forget and things that we do and how can they all work together, I think is going to be super important in building systems that can continuously update their knowledge base and update what they know. That's an example of an implementation. I have a question that might be naive, but so we have long-term memory and short-term memory, but then I guess the problem is trying to understand what needs to be consolidated and then become long-term memory and what can be disregarded with this delay that you were talking about, right? Is there any way to choose and select what's important or what's salient to be remembered somehow? So I think that's a very tough question, right? So in fact, this is ongoing research. And we have one grant right now that's specifically asking that question, but from a different perspective. It's basically saying, can saliency drive learning to make it simpler, to make the credit assignment simpler, to make the complexity of the network less, and so on? But what you're asking is the other way around, right? Essentially, if I was to run my saliency algorithm now on my memories, can I pick only those that, are, that I think are salient to my life and so on. I don't know that, I, I, at least I haven't seen any work on that front. It would be interesting to see whether that can be done. I do think that, you know, it reminds me of humans again, human memories. There are certain things, you know, when you got scared when you were a three-year-old or whatever, that element might stick in your brain for a long time, or your first kiss or whatever. Those were very salient to you, so therefore it stays a little bit longer. So that clearly has that loop, but yeah, I don't know whether folks are thinking about how to combine that in any deep learning system or any kind of learning system that we know. To me, this is just inherent to learning in biological organisms uh, about survival. It's about ignoring the things that are not important. And then because the signals are not important, they don't propagate so far down the chain of neurons. So the deeper the signals propagate through the brain, the more salient they must have been in the first place. Otherwise, they wouldn't have got through all of the gatekeepers in between. So to me, the whole endeavor of building neural networks is about constantly evaluating the saliency of signals and memories. That's all one thing. Yeah, I don't agree, right? Because I remember the square root of three, you know? <laughs> is that really important to my survival? Probably not. Maybe you can argue it is from a perspective of my education, right? <laughs> I had to get a degree at some point, I had to take exams or whatever the case may be. But I do think there are certain things that we learn that may not be as important as other things. But we're geeks, right? Lots of geeks used to know so many digits of pi, and that was a different kind of saliency. 
Yes, it's not going to make your life in the long term any better. But when you're 10 or 14 and you can say 20 digits of pi and your friends can only say four and you're with the right kind of people, then it's cool. I listen to teenagers talk about the world and there's so much trivia there, but it's trivia that's got some salience to their social interaction. So I think the things that we remember, they may not be relevant now, but they must have been at some point, or I don't think we would have stored them. Okay, so maybe I agree with you in a sense of ultimately we prune and keep the things that are salient, right, as humans. But do machine learning algorithms today do that? I think humans definitely do it, no question about it. But this is a lifelong learning thing, like what Josh Vogelstein does, where you're walking around, you're learning things and so on. And the question then is, is there a moment where you stop and say, ah, I've learned all this stuff, but I don't really care about this half. Let me discard it and let me keep this other half. Okay, this is really philosophical, all this discussion. But I have a story that relates to it. So I remember decades ago when I first started understanding the concept of identifiable classes, so things you might recognize. My understanding at that time was that essentially you would lump things into one class until you decided that although similar, something you saw was different enough to justify starting a new class. That also got me noticing how my own mind works. Maybe you've had this happen to you as well, but I realized somehow that I was lumping people into classes, not in a stereotype way necessarily, but weirdly as individuals. <laughs> Let me explain. So there was this guy I knew who was an editor of mine who reminded me of another friend who was a colleague I'd known for years. They were both big English guys with beards. Both were very smart, and I didn't see either of them very often. And I realized I'd lumped them together like this when I met up with my editor at an event and was really surprised that he looked like himself and not like my other friend. Although functionally, in my mind, they were very different people, as personalities, they had become the same person. Which makes me wonder whether our development of stereotypes might be a function of our just not being bothered to remember the distinctions between people. Maybe our lack of care or interest, saliency, if you will, means it doesn't seem relevant for us to differentiate between those that we see as lumped into a single class. I don't know, but I think you can see elements of that where we're throwing away information, we as humans, that could be useful to us. So all I'm saying is philosophically, these problems are there one way or the other, whether it's in machines or people. Although obviously we have much more sophisticated memories controlled by hormones and other things going on in the body, etc. Yes, and we do a lot more of that curation than I think what happens in machine learning. We curate everything, right? We like this person, we don't like that person. The learned objects in a DNN doesn't say, I like this object more than I like that object, right? He just says, ah, object A, object B, that's it. It would be interesting, Julia, then, to put on a, another layer. So it's not even, it's meta-learning, but <laughs> what's the opposite of meta? You know, a way to post hoc, to clean up, to throw out what I like and throw out. So what is the notion of liking from a machine learning perspective? That may be um, Emery's next big problem. I was actually even thinking whilst you were speaking about the fact that we can even make it more complex because humans make up memories. So we make mm. it up. We not only remember, forget, but we also make it up. <laughs> so right. it would be another right. layer of complexity. Which brings us into dreaming, right? And the things that we make up in order to consolidate what we've been learning in real life. When... I was in Bern at the university there. I saw some interesting work talking about learning through dreaming. And I know that's a field that's existed for a while. So you're absolutely right, Julia. I learned to ride the bicycle through dreams. I tried it for a day. I fell, dreamt about it, and I woke up the next day and I rode right off. I have a similar story, although mine is about second-order differential equations. When I was in high school, I remember trying to do my homework and just not being successful with this one problem. 
And I went to sleep, I dreamt on it, and the next morning I was able to get out of bed and just finish my homework. It was great. So yes, dreams are very helpful. But I know you wanted to talk about Riyad Benozman and how you felt about some of the work that Emre did and how it had echoes of Riyad's work. Yeah, exactly. So the surrogate gradient uh, learning approach that Emre talks about, right? Essentially converting a spike to a bump that is differentiable and then being able to, to use that to create the, uh, the appropriate chain rule that allows the backpropagation to work and associate the credit where credit is required. So the HOTS algorithm that Riyad um, talked about as well deals with spikes, but while he doesn't talk about it in terms of gradients and so on, he does create these surfaces which are synaptic activation surfaces that then becomes a spatial temporal model of what an object looks like and then that can be then be used for identification so there is a little bit of a of an echo of each other there right emre's one is more on the neuron side whereas riyadh's work is more on the synaptic side even though ultimately emre's work is also being used to update synapses so there is this interesting loop. So I wonder how those two sets of algorithms, the surrogate gradient learning as well as HOTS, whether there's a place for them to merge. And maybe that can be the next big, the big thing for the field. I don't know. I have other two points. Then the first one is that I loved when you asked at uh, some point, but these classical approaches might just run over neuromorphic because it was really mm. interesting for me to know his point of view, Emre point of view. And I really love the fact that he precisely spots specific applications, so small compact devices and cars. And I think we never really mentioned the fact that we can use neuromorphic for smartphones. And I want to bring up one thing that is really interesting and um, Prophecy partnering with Qualcomm on fast, even based smartphones. So we are like we are in the real world now. We are playing into the real world, and I think it's extremely important to mention this thing. Has anyone taken them up on that? Uh, actually, I wrote a news story. I don't write a lot of news stories anymore. It's not what I do, but I wrote a that news story when Qualcomm announced it. And my understanding was that it was a joint development platform. So they have, if I remember correctly, the Snapdragon AI chip that they produce, and then Prophecy have their vision chip. And the idea is that they're co-developing them so that OEMs, companies who want to make their own mobile phones can buy these in. But I don't know if there are any products that have actually come out with that yet. I mean, it's certainly a step in the right direction, but I don't know if anything's actually being used by the public yet. Do you know, Julia? If I am not mistaken, what they're trying to do is that they're trying to interpolate a normal video with events. So they're trying to make the, the videos better thanks to the events. But I. I think it's something that came out from Skaramuza first. I think a lot of people have been doing this kind of work before, but I also think you're right, Julia, that what's exciting about this is potentially it could be getting into things that we can buy as consumers. However, I just don't know whether that's actually happened yet or whether it's just a development deal that was set up and there haven't been any takers. At least there aren't any yet that I know of. It hasn't been long, though. I have to say it's less than a year since that story came out. I'll put a link to the EE Times article I wrote about it, and maybe someone can tell us whether there have been some takers. You had a second point, didn't you, Julia? Yes. And the second point is the project on the prosthetic arm, which I think is the end goal of what we guys do, but it is my opinion and I love it. So I know that he's mm -hmm. working with Kenneth Stewart and uh, Massimiliano Giacomo with um, Chiara Bartolozzi. They're working together. I can't go too much into the details because there is an NDA. So I hope I don't spoil things that I shouldn't do. But what they're trying to do is, of course, using Spike Neuro Network to train prosthesis. And it's beautiful and I can't wait. Yes, in English is can't wait. I can't wait mm -hmm. to uh, listen to Elisa Donati and what she is doing too, because she's really working hard on EMG. And again, to me, and please, Ralph, forgive me, this is the killer application. 
<laughs> and uh, to me, this is helping humans. And don't kill anybody. Right. Don't kill anything. Don't kill anything. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you think, guys? I think it's amazing, and I can't wait to, to listen to Lisa. So I think I should just make clear to the listeners that Julia is alluding to the fact that we've already done an interview with Elisa Donati from the Institute of Neuroinformatics in Zurich, which we will be releasing on the podcast at some point in the future. Also, we have Kenneth Stewart, who she's mentioned, and apparently these two are now working together, which I hadn't realized. I think that's relatively recent. So I just thought I'd make that clear. So, so the only thing I would say is this, right? So if you're reading EMG, then I think you are a little bit lost. By the time you get to EMG, the signal has been filtered through so many different filters. And yes, you can identify maybe individual muscle fibers, but it's hard, right? Why not go back one layer higher and actually tap into the nerve fascicles? where now you're getting actual spikes, right? As opposed to just analog aggregate of spikes that comes to the muscle. That's where I think it'll be interesting. That's what Nitish Thacker was doing, right? Yeah, there's some aspect of the electrodes that he was developing that would wrap around the fascicle and penetrate and so on. And there are other folks, some of his students also working on that as well, right? But that I think is where the interesting part is now. The EMG scenario is, essentially the easier one, right? And in fact, this has been proven, right? Todd Kalkin from Chicago Institute of Rehabilitation and so on has demonstrated this. So you basically re-innovate certain part of the body, then you put on EMG recording devices, that EMG recording device gets decoded. This is all classical stuff, right? It's not normal from the sense, but it works. And that is being used to control a prosthetic limb where, you know, folks have been able to pick up cups, drink, hold eggs, without crushing them and all those kinds of things. So that aspect has been done, but I think what has not been as well followed through on is tapping into the nerve fascicles, be it at the distal points or even more centrally at the spinal cord itself, right at the output of the spinal cord in the ventral roots, whether that can be done. That would be, I think, where your not killer, but uh, living apps, <laughs> living app would, would actually sit. <laughs> And actually, the particular thing of this specific uh, project, let's say, is that you might think that when you do learning or your model is learning, you need to generalize enough to then classify well. But then what you do instead in this case is to tailor your model on the person. And actually, the person needs to retrain every month because your yeah. arm can change. And then you are not generalizing, but you are actually tailoring as much as you can. Mm. to the person and I think it's just so uh, beautiful it's counterintuitive and beautiful and I like it yeah and that would be another example of lifelong learning again you don't want to catastrophically forget what your arm looked like so you have to relearn everything every morning but you just want to marginally learn what just has changed, right? I've gotten a little bit more muscles, I'm a little bit stronger or weaker, and I'm tired today. All those kinds of little nuance that can be trained and that can be updated instead of having to learn everything from scratch, right? So that would be really cool. Uh, one last thing, I think Emre's work is pivotal. I think Emre is right in saying his surrogate uh, gradient learning did open up a few doors in thinking about how to do learning that is more similar to the traditional DNNs and stuff with spiking networks. So that really made it possible for people to start thinking about, okay, we may be able to use this platform to do more than just let me mimic biology, right? So I like the fact that there is that parallelism between the two sides of the argument. And I don't want to steal Kenneth Stewart's thunder because he's going to talk about that a little when we have him on later in the season. But one of the things he did as a PhD student with Emre back at UC Irvine, I believe, is that he worked on one-shot learning with this gradient descent. And what's important about that, at least from my point of view, is that it means that you can do your training offline, then you can impose your neural network into an imperfect device and use your one-shot or few-shot learning to do the final tweaks to make it work the way it's supposed to, or perhaps to learn an extra class or two that are going to be important for the device in its operation. I'm probably not doing it justice, but Kenneth will be on to talk about it properly later in the season. 
And with that plug for a future episode, let me thank Sunny for another interview and Ralph for some interesting perspective. In our next episode, Sunny will be talking to Dr. Shi Chi Liu of the Institute for Neuromorphic Engineering in Zurich. We hope you join us then. That brings another episode of EE Times Current to a close. Thank you for listening and thanks to our guest, Professor Emre Neftsi. EE Times Current is available through all the major podcast platforms, but if you reach us at our website, eetimes.com, you'll find a transcript of this episode along with other resources. EE Times Current is produced by EE Times. It was engineered by Greg McRae and Taylor Marvin at Coop Studios in Boulder, Colorado. The segment producer was Stephanie Munoz. I'm Eric Singer. Thanks for listening. 